Hi everyone, this is lecture one for POS 201, Introduction to Political Theory. I'm Rob Glover, the instructor. So this is really our first uh, substantive lecture in uh, the course, Intro to Political Theory. And I'll lay out what we're going to be examining today. So first, um, in order to talk about the types of questions that political theory asks, we have to talk about political science at universities in the United States, its fields, its structure. Um, and we'll talk specifically about the types of questions that are asked in political science versus those that are asked in political theory. So some of you have probably taken courses in political science. Um, you have some sense of kind of, you know, what the field is and what types of things we examine, what types of things we're interested in. Political theory is a little different. And so we'll go into some of those distinctions. We'll talk about the sometimes antagonistic relationship between political science and political theory because they're doing different things. They sometimes come into conflict with one another. And then um, we'll kind of bring it full circle by talking about this piece you've read by Isaiah Berlin about the death of political theory, pluralism, and um, where his analyses, his questions fit in relation to the study of political theory. So uh, first off, as you all know, this a class is taught within the political science department here at the University of Maine. And in political science, the field of political science in the United States, you have a number of different subfields. Um, and some of you are probably aware of this. You've probably taken courses in some of those different subfields. So for instance, um, you know, the, the types of questions that you are asking and the types of things that you are looking at in your intro to American government class are different than the types of things you would look at types of questions you would ask in your international relations class. And that relates to these, this difference in subfields that we have in political science. And we can say roughly there are four subfields in political science as it's taught in American universities. So first off, you have international relations. Um, that is the study of politics above the level of the state. So above the level of individual countries, you start to deal with interactions and forms of exchange between different countries. You take a course in international relations and that's what you study. Comparative politics, you're comparing different national political systems of government and different forms of political organization. So you could be looking at um, you know, parliamentary systems versus presidential systems or different types of electoral systems, different, um, different forms of uh, delivering policy, different ways that countries structure their welfare state and delivering benefits to their citizens. That's what you'd be dealing with in comparative politics. American politics is a subfield unto itself. It's the study of politics within the United States. It could be the study of the Congress, study of the presidency, study of interest groups, political parties, um, but you're largely focused on, on politics in the United States. And then you have political theory, which is what we're going to lay out today. And we'll talk about how it's kind of different and um, that makes it interesting. And a lot of people really gravitate towards political theory because of its, its different focus. Now at some, oh, at some schools, um, you'll also have a branch called public law where specifically you focus on law, society, um, the, judici the judicial branch within the United States. And at other universities, this is simply subsumed under American politics. But that kind of gives you um, the lay of the land in terms of how we structure political science as a discipline and how we tend to investigate the different areas of political science. So then, um, within the discipline of political science, really there are a huge number of questions that we ask uh, ourselves and a number of different types of questions. And this is important because um, it, it kind of is the foundation for the questions that we ask in political science, and it begins to give you a sense of how political theory is different than political science. And we call these different questions that we ask within political science empirical questions, right? So we'll, we'll talk specifically about what that means, but let me just lay out the different types, and hopefully that can, that can clarify things as to what these, these different questions are. So the first type of question that we ask is a descriptive question. These are questions which ask us to describe something. We're asking uh, questions like who and what and when and where. Um, an example would be who participates in politics? We ask this question all the time, right? Is 
how are people engaging in political life and who are the people that are most engaged in political life? And so, uh, for instance, in the United States, we know that um, older folks, more wealthy folks, more educated folks tend to participate in politics more than younger folks, um, less educated folks, less wealthy individuals, right? So that's something that it's a descriptive question. We simply have to go out and kind of collect the information and find out who is participating, how they're participating, and a little bit about them. And we can answer those questions about who participates in politics. Explanatory questions are a little bit more complex. They ask you to explain something. You're, they're asking you to, uh, you know, try to map out a cause and effect relationship. And you're articulating different variables that influence or impact something. Right. And these questions we tend to be asking why or how. So maybe we take that same question right, uh, about who participates in politics. We go one level deeper and we say, OK, why is it that younger folks don't participate more in politics? Why is it that income seems to have this relationship with how active people are in political life? And that requires us to do more work. It's a more complex question. To, to answer. And then the last type of empirical question that we might ask is, is very complex and often it's very risky to engage in this form of questioning, but it, it's predictive. It asks us to predict a future event or outcome. So based on the information that we have, based on what we know about what types of, of factors tend to influence outcomes, can we kind of look into our political crystal ball and try to predict what will happen in the future. And so we're using, uh, you know, future oriented questions like who will or what will, right? So maybe you have your eyes towards uh, the 2020 presidential election. You're saying, okay, who will participate in the 2020 presidential election? And you could either be forecasting, you know, who the likely candidates are, who is going to be running in that election, or you could be asking what types of groups are going to um, donate money or work on behalf of different parties and candidates, who is actually going to get out there and vote, right? So participation can take many different forms, but you're asking what will happen in the future, and you're trying to, on the best available evidence that you have, make some prediction about the future. What these questions have in common is that they're all empirical questions. They're uh, asking questions of what exists or what might exist on the basis of the evidence that we have before us and the evidence that we can collect and trying to offer answers to, to these questions on the basis of that evidence. Um, that's the majority of the work that is done in those subfields of political science. The majority of the work that we do is empirical. It's scientific. Now, granted, we're dealing with the social sciences, so the information and the data that we collect looks a little bit different than if you were, you know, investigating hypotheses in a biology class, right? But it's still based on the same premise that we have a world in which we can ask questions and answer those questions on the basis of data and evidence. Political theory is a little bit different. And it's one of the things that makes it distinctive. And I think the core way to get at the difference with political theory is to focus on the, the difference in the questions that we ask in political theory. So we say that in political theory, uh, we ask normative questions. Now, what is a normative question? Well, if you've ever looked at the world and looked at politics in particular and asked yourself what ought to be, so what is right or what is just or what is the good wise political decision in a given situation that is the realm in which political theory exists it's you're asking yourself a normative question and that's the type of activity that we tend to associate with political theory is this normative questioning so normative questions are questions which ask us to judge something those questions usually involve the words ought or should so um you know, why should we participate in politics? Why ought we uh, participate in politics? Should more people participate in politics? Why should they, right? And it's not to say that political theory ignores the empirical world, right? Sometimes we make this distinction between facts and values. So facts refer to the empirical world. It's data that's out there that we can go out and measure and capture. 
And this realm in which we're asking questions that involve judgment, we call the normative world. And we might refer to it as values, right? Um, it doesn't ignore that, right? Political theory does not ignore what is happening in the world, but it uses what's happening in the political world as a springboard to think about what ought to be. And the goal of political theory is always um, evaluating and judging what is happening in our political lives and what should be happening in our political lives. In political theory, we tend to talk more about concepts than data or evidence. Um, so things like justice and freedom and citizenship and political obligation, equality, participation, identity, even democracy, right? What is democracy? What is the ideal form of democracy? And we do so not necessarily to find the best way to measure them empirically, but um, to really explore these concepts in terms of what they should be, ideally. And again, I can't stress this enough that it's not to say that political theory ignores the real world or that somehow removed from reality. I think that's sometimes the, the sense that students get when they take a course that's more philosophical or conceptual in nature like this, that it ignores the real world. It's simply um, that the emphasis in political theory is more on what we ought to be doing and then really describing what happens or, or why it happens. So um, political theory is sometimes referred to as a great conversation, right? Because it deals with this less empirical realm of politics and it's more in the, the normative realm of what should happen and what should be done, it's probably the most unique subfield within political science. There's no other field that has um, this sustained emphasis on judgment. And it's also the oldest, without a doubt. Um, people began thinking about these normative questions about what should be done politically really at the onset of large-scale forms of political and social organization thousands of years ago. Really, you know, as soon as we started living in relatively advanced and organized political communities, we started to ask these questions. And the ability to scientifically study politics and ask and answer empirical questions in the manner that we do today really only came much later. It wasn't until... Um, the mid 20th century that we even had good ways of measuring public opinion and doing public opinion polling. I mean, that's a really, really recent phenomenon. Whereas asking questions about what ought to be in politics begins um, at least in the 6th century BC in ancient Greece, right? Um, perhaps even earlier, you know, we might just not have the best recorded records of these periods. Uh, so it's, it, it, in that way is um, something with a, with a much longer historical duration. And the first real great era of thinking about politics is associated with what we call the golden age of ancient Athens, so 5th to 4th century BC. Um, this is a period in which thinkers like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, uh, they emerge from this time and they're asking questions about the nature of the good life and the proper organization of the city-state the nature of the just society, the qualities that we associate with behaving justly, right? So this is where we begin our investigation of political theory uh, when we start to read Socrates and Plato as we, we go back to that period and we read some of the foundational texts of political theory. Um, the long history of political thought is why political theory is sometimes referred to as a great conversation. So in many ways, when we engage in political theory today, uh, we're asking ourselves some of the same normative questions about what political, our political lives should be uh, that were asked thousands of years ago. We're taking part in a conversation that's been going on across generations, across centuries. And we're asking the same questions that others have asked before us. And many would say that because of that, there's something enduring and something lasting about political theory that sets it apart from the other subfields of political science um, that makes it distinct, right? So when you ask yourself, what is justice? Or is, is this the right thing to do? Should you know, the president do this? Or should the Congress do this? Should we have universal health care? Should we go to war? Um, those are questions which others have embarked on. Right. And other people have, have engaged with those questions of, of justice and what we owe to our fellow citizens and how we responsibly use violence. Right. And so you're engaging with the same sorts of questions that have been asked across generations. 
And you might end up with a different conclusion than others. You might end up with a different set of attitudes and perspectives than previous generations have had. But what you're doing is political theory. That is political theory. That's the core of what we do. So that's why uh, what we do in here and what we read in here is not just, you know, it's not just better understanding history. It's not this antiquarian thing that uh, is removed from our everyday lives, but it's really, really essential and important activity. And the question of what we should do in politics is something that we face every day and something which in a representative democracy, um, our representatives face every day. And so these are the questions that guide our political order and shape what we want it to be. Now, to talk about political theory, we have to contrast it to the social sciences. It's, it's kind of strangely lumped in with the social sciences and political science is a social science, right? It's a, an attempt to use the scientific method to understand human behavior and the behavior of human beings in societies. Um, and as I said, that's a relatively recent phenomenon. Um, so social science is positivism. It's a fancy word that really gets at uh, something that's that's very easy to understand and grapple with. Um, basically in the 1940s and 1950s we started to have the types of tools and the types of approaches that enabled us to study the social world and the political world in the same way that previously the natural scientific world had been studied. We had developed new ways of accessing data and information. There was new statistical methods. Um, public opinion polling had finally, we finally understood the basis of things like um, the importance of a random sample and the importance of having a certain number of uh, well, well chosen individuals as a basis to generalize for a larger population, which we really didn't have. There's some really you know, scandalous and in retrospect funny errors that were made on the basis of people just not knowing how to get a good sample of the population on which to make some broader generalization that we managed to overcome by the 1940s and the 1950s. And we started to be very systematic and very uh, intentional in how we collected data and what types of data we collected. And this is also the era in which we could subject large amounts of data and information for the first time to empirical analysis with the assistance of computers, which has come a long way you know, since the 1950s and the 1960s to the point where now the type of work that you can do on your laptop with statistical data uh, would have been unthinkable even with the most advanced computers in the world 50 or 60 years ago. So with that, with these trends, in uh, how we were adopting a scientific approach to studying politics, uh, uh, really a new emphasis on how we study the social world had taken root. And because of this newfound emphasis on empirical questions and new tools with which to ask and answer empirical questions, um, it gradually gave way to this idea that that is the proper way to study the social world and the political world, right? There was this debate that arose within um, universities and academic circles that the way that you study the social and political world is through access to data and through empirical analysis, as opposed to this prior, um, more philosophical, more conceptual uh, approach. And so we start to see the separation of the empirical realm of facts, right, and social science from the normative realm of values. And so these, these normative questions of what should be, what ought to be, were seen as beyond the competence of science. That's not something that you should scientifically try to answer. And there was a real push for the social sciences, so you know, economics and, and political science and sociology and, and those fields, they should aspire to value neutrality in the same way that, um, you know, the, the, in the natural sciences, if you're studying geology, you don't necessarily have like a normative commitment to one outcome or the other. You try to be objective. And so social science uh, was, there was a push within social science to aspire to that same level of value neutrality. 
And that really is the context in which um, Isaiah Berlin, who you read for today, that's the context in which he's writing his piece. Those who are arguing for a normative conception, who are holding on to that older idea of politics and political analysis being about asking questions of what ought to be, what should be, uh, versus those saying, no, we need a scientific approach. We need to aspire to value neutrality. And some, the most extreme that held on to this idea of value neutrality are even saying political theory is dead, right? This, this theoretical, conceptual, philosophical approach to political theory is dead. And so Berlin is trying to respond to that. He's trying to respond to the idea that we should step away from asking questions about what ought to be, what should be, and focus on empirical objective analysis. And I'll just say at the outset, it's, it's, a, it's a premise that he, he dismisses. And so the whole piece that you're reading, I know it's complex reading, but he's really trying to kind of dis, uh, dispel the idea that political theory could ever die, that it could ever simply you know, meet its demise. So he says basically there's two reasons why an academic discipline, a field of study, would die. Right? The first is that its central presuppositions are no longer accepted. They've withered away or they've been refuted and destroyed by argument. The second is um, new disciplines have come to perform the work that was originally undertaken in that older form of study. So what does that mean? Um, in the first instance, Berlin mentions phrenology. Um, this is kind of interesting. You might have heard of this, but this was this thing that was done uh, primarily in the 19th century that attempted to ascertain information about personality and mood and the mind by studying or reading bumps or fissures in the skull. So they had tools and implements that they would use to study, you know, the, the shape and circumference and curvature of your skull and uh, then they would make generalizations about the inner working of your mind with reference to this data that they collected it, it sounds a little nutty now right but this was a widely accepted field this was how generalizations were made about human behavior prior to the emergence of um, modern psychiatry uh, psychology, cognitive neuroscience, those fields come along and they displace phrenology. And now it's pretty much viewed as a joke. And if somebody's engaged in something, you know, that seems dubious scientifically, you know, you can accuse them of being a phrenologist. Um, but that was, uh, that was a, an accepted way of trying to analyze the, um, the workings of, of the human mind, right? And it was eventually, its central presuppositions were no longer accepted. So the idea that you could feel somebody's head and make generalizations about their mental health or their well-being, those were no longer accepted. And you had new disciplines emerge like psychology or cognitive neuroscience to displace phrenology, right? So Berlin in the early 1960s is asking whether uh, either of those reasons, either of those um, justifications for why an academic, academic discipline would die apply to political theory. Um, has normative questioning regarding politics, has the question of what ought to be the ideal political system or the ideal form of democracy or what our responsibilities are as citizens, is that really just kind of obsolete and a waste of time? And what we need to focus on is empirical analysis. And his answer to the question, is political theory dead, is a resounding no, right? So admittedly, he's a little bit biased. He's a political theorist. But he says that in both cases, um, in, in both uh, the, the two reasons for the demise of a discipline, uh, in, on both fronts, political theory still holds up. Its central presuppositions still hold, right? So the idea that it is valuable to ask ourselves what should or ought to exist with regard to the political, that still holds. And also nothing has stepped in to do the work which political theory did previously. You know, there's still a realm in which we ask what is good, what is right, what is just, what is our responsibility as a citizen. It's not uh, something that's become antiquated. 
It's not something that has become obsolete or useless. And in particular, um, given the fact that it's the early 1960s and the world is what the world was in the early 1960s, Berlin is, is particularly um, frustrated with the fact that we're even asking this question. So think about this for a second. What's happening in world politics in the early 1960s that leads Berlin to say this question is absurd? And if you know a little bit about the history of the period, uh, or you've talked to, I don't know, probably your, your grandparents were alive during this period and have at least some memory of what the world was like, uh, hopefully you know the answer is, is the Cold War. You had this confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union. And yes, it was political and it was a military confrontation. You had two sides building up weapons that were incredibly destructive and dangerous. And it was also economic. You had competing economic systems. At its heart, it was a normative battle, according to Berlin. This is a standoff that threatens the existence of the entire world and the heart of what is at stake. The reason why these two major powers have come into confrontation is that the political and economic form of organization is disputed. There's democracy and capitalism, as the West argued, or there's a centralized one-party state like you had in the Soviet Union with a command socialist economy. So arguably, for Berlin, the most important question that faces the world at this time, and one which literally threatens to devolve into a nuclear war and potentially destroy life on Earth, is a normative question. And yet here we are, says Berlin, having a debate over whether or not questions regarding what ought to be, what should be, normative questions, still have a place within the study of politics. So political theory is not dead, according to Berlin, and it's it shows how out of touch we are in the 1960s that we're even having this debate, that we think we've somehow transcended normative questioning as a realm of politics. So why is political theory unique in relation to empirical inquiry? Berlin says not only that political theory hasn't been replaced by empirical inquiry, right? So it's not that like this normative questioning that dates back to the ancient Greeks has been replaced. He says it actually can't happen. You cannot replace the types of questions that are asked in political theory with empirical inquiry. He says, empirical methods of political analysis ask questions that can be answered through certain methods, observation, inference, formal logic, collecting data, right? Um, there are certain types of questions, certain types of even political questions that we can, we can answer we can ask and we can answer using those methods. He says political theory, the types of questions we ask, there's no universally accepted, accepted answer, and there's not a single method by which we can arrive at one. Right? So why is political theory uh, still relevant? Well, it's the fact that the types of questions we ask, we simply couldn't have universal consensus, and there's not really any means by which we could arrive at one. The example that, that he gives is why do we obey our government, right? Now hopefully in a stable, well-ordered political system, the answer that we all, all give when we're asked should we obey the government is yes, right? Um, but we should have some sort of justification for why, and it should transcend merely they have weapons and can hurt us, right? But there's a lot of different competing justifications for why we obey our government. Why, when you come up to a red light, you stop, or when um, a cop asks you for your identification, you give it to them, or when you have to register for selective service, you do so, or when you have to pay your taxes, you do so, right? Why do we do that? There's a whole bunch of different reasons, compelling reasons, why you could say, yes, I'm going to do this. Um, but there's no universal consensus, and there's no way I could ever definitively make the case that my theory of why you should obey your government is better than your theory of why you should obey your government. It's kind of an endless conversation, but it's a fruitful conversation. It's not a waste of time to think actively about why we obey our government. It's just that we could never arrive at a single definitive answer. Whereas in the natural sciences, we potentially could, right? There are certain things that we can say, 
pretty concretely we know about the world and there would perhaps be kind of a sliver of dissent or a sliver of people who say no actually I don't agree with that but the, the possibility of a universal consensus is much more real in the natural sciences than it is in the in the social sciences and even our social uh, surroundings and our political lives so for Berlin he's saying political theory is something that will always be important and relevant um, because of this there is a certain orientation that we have to adopt towards our lives right because there's no single answer to the normative questions of political theory uh, there's always a scope for human judgment and so Berlin as a result of this as a result of just his disposition that you can't answer these questions once and for all um, believes in the importance of liberty in the expression of ideas and opinions and this is something that in the United States is is really widely valued right at least in in theory um, we really really value the freedom of speech and we get really nervous when people start talking about uh, the need to curtail, curtail the freedom of speech or place limits on the freedom of speech even if the speech itself is sometimes objectionable or we don't agree with it we're kind of ingrained with this idea that freedom of speech our first amendment rights and our constitution are really important so he states in another work of his I'll just um, quote that for you um, that uh, the notion that there must exist final objective answers to normative questions, truths that can be demonstrated or directly intuited, that it is in principle possible to discover a harmonious pattern in which all values are reconciled, and that it is towards this unique goal that we must make, that we uncover some single principle that shapes this vision, a principle which once found will govern our lives, this ancient and almost universal belief on which so much traditional thought and action and philosophical doctrine rests seems to me invalid and at times to have led and still to lead to absurdities in theory and barbarous consequences in practice what is he, what he's describing there is what we call monism um, monism you have to be careful with that word because in philosophy monism um, is uh, has a very different meaning than what he's talking about here um, he's specifically talking about monism with regard to values right so he's he's discussing and he's dismissing the idea in a single universal truth or a single ideology um, he says it leads to absurdities in theory it leads to barbarous consequences in practice he gives concrete examples he talks about uh, Christian theologians at the time of you know the Inquisition or the Crusades he talks about the ancient Greeks at various points had this idea that there is a single universal truth um, Soviet style communism which you know ordered an entire society around a very very rigid and singular interpretation of what society ought to be and punished any sort of dissent and the example that always comes up and, and is always uh, cited is European fascism, right? Nazism, Mussolini, various fascist elements, all united around the idea that there is a single universal truth and pursuing it so vigorously that if you rejected their universal truth, you were a traitor, you were an enemy of the state, you would you know, face imprisonment or exile or uh, you know, death to question the single universal truth that's something that Berlin wants to reject and he's rejecting it at a time in which World War II which forced Berlin to flee for his life was a recent memory right so he thinks that the way that society ought to be organized and particularly our political lives ought to be organized is pluralism the idea that because there's no single answer to these questions these normative questions society needs to provide as much space for as many different ideas and identities and positions and viewpoints and ideologies as we possibly can that is how our society ought to be constructed and we call that pluralism now again pluralism is something that has multiple meanings in political science pluralism refers to constructing society around competing interest groups and creating a political system that can channel those various interest groups into ways that benefit society as a whole he is talking about value pluralism right which is more on the normative end of things and that's what he means by it is that society exists to create a foundation um, 
really kind of a palette in which all of these different perspectives can be voiced and can potentially compete for um, acceptance and acknowledgement as true and valued and, and can shape what our lives look like, what policy looks like, how we construct our society. So his belief in the importance of human liberty is rooted in his idea that we can't answer any of those really important questions that we identified at the outset, those normative questions, definitively. So let's circle back and talk about um, political theory's relationship to political science. So as I said at the outset, you are taking this course in a political science department. Somehow political theory, although it's existed longer than our scientific study of, of politics, has ended up lumped in with political science. So what is the relationship between the two? How do they inform each other? How do you take what you learn in this political theory class and bring it to your broader study of political science in a way that's useful and valued and makes sense of the relationships between these different fields. Um, I would argue there's basically three roles that political theory plays in relation to political science. The first is conceptual. So political theory is this realm of the discipline of political science in which we define our most fundamental concepts. So if we're going to study democracy, for example, um, or if we're even going to use the term democracy, if we're going to refer to a country in the world as a democracy or a non-democracy, well, first we have to define what we mean by democracy. And in order to do that, we need to talk about what democracy conceptually is. What does it mean to say that a country is democratic or not democratic or more democratic or less democratic than another country? That's normative because what we define as democracy is rooted in our conceptions of what ought to be, what ought to exist, right? So there's no way to, to use that term, not even just like in the study of political science, but, but in everyday political discourse. If you use the term democracy and you have an internal understanding of what that means, you're making a normative claim. It's a claim about what ought to exist. Um, we also use the term uh, legitimacy, right? That's another good example. So what does it mean to say that um, you know, Angela Merkel in Germany is a more legitimate leader, has more political legitimacy than Vladimir Putin in Russia? It's, you, know, you can go out and you can measure the ways in which those political systems are legitimate or illegitimate, but you have to have first an understanding of what that means? What does it mean to possess political legitimacy? And that requires us first to think at a very abstract and theoretical level about what those terms mean when we use them. The second important relationship that political theory has to political science is historical. So political theory is the realm of the discipline in which we explore the history of ideas, what influential figures wrote and spoke, and the impact that they had on political outcomes. So, for example, how do the writings of Karl Marx eventually lead to revolutionary upheaval, not only in Russia, but in Latin America, in Southeast Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and elsewhere, right? It's very, very hard to look at the revolution that happened in Russia in 1917 and not eventually go back to the writings of Karl Marx, to what he was saying about the working class and the capitalist system, the need for revolutionary overthrow, and link the two in some way. Similarly, if you want to understand our constitution, right? If you want to understand, um, you know, the foundational document that structures all of our political institutions and our entire political system, and against which we we assess uh, the legitimacy of policy and action and leaders. You need to go back and, and read John Locke, and you need to look at what was happening in the European Enlightenment and the ideas that gave rise to this perspective on representative democracy and, and what it ought to be. So um, there are those that study something called the history of political thought, and that's pretty much what they do. They study the relationship between historical writings and then the ideas uh, and the role that they play in shaping human history. Lastly, I would argue that the third role of political theory in relation to political science is programmatic. So political theory is the realm of political science 
in which we articulate a political program, we articulate a concrete conception of what the world we desire ought to look like and why. And you can't do that strictly empirically, right? Um, it, it can't be done simply by explaining, describing, and predicting. At some initial point, you need to have a vision of what the world should look like and why. And so political theory is the realm of political science in which that happens. Um, you, you construct an ideal, right? And then you go about establishing the blueprint or the pathway to get from your ideal to actual policies and institutions and political candidates and things like that. But at the outset, you need to have some sort of ideal conception of what you want the world to look like. And to operate with, without one is really dangerous to just kind of go with the flow and not have a concrete sense of your ideals and your values and what you want to construct in the world. So I think there's really, you know, these three roles and potentially more um, that make political theory valuable. And it's why I think this course in particular is, is really important before we start, before we get too far in our political lives or we get too far into the study of political science to have that theoretical grounding. So we'll wrap up there for today. Um, there is a video for this week. It's um, former Maine Senator Olympia Snow, who uh, famously resigned from Congress or did not seek another term in Congress um, on the basis of what she felt was hyper-partisanship. She just kind of grew frustrated with the degree of... Um, party loyalty and kind of the toxic and ultimately ineffective and ineffectual um, manner in which politics was being conducted in Washington, D.C. And so she has become a big advocate for trying to draw down some of the partisanship and find ways that Republicans and Democrats and independents can work together in Washington, D.C. So there's just a short clip of her talking about partisanship in Congress that I think is very relevant to um, what we what we confront in American politics today. In the discussion board, I want you to think about um, these contemporary debates over partisanship in relation to Berlin's view on pure pluralism. Think about his justification for why pluralism is important and the ability to speak uh, your mind on issues and, and to have a setting, an environment in which lots of different ideas can you know kind of bounce around against each other. Uh, is important for our society and for the world as a whole. Uh, and I, th I think it is, I think there are parallels and relationships that, that we can see there. The next lecture um, is on Plato's two works by uh, Plato involving Socrates as the, the protagonist. These are two really core works of Western political philosophy. In the defense um, sometimes translated as the apology, but the defense is really a better, a better um, translation. In the defense, Socrates is on trial for his life in Athens, and he's offering a defense for his crime, and he's particularly defiant, right? It's not, that's why the apology, it's, um, it's kind of a weird translation because there's nothing apologetic about it. Um, that was the Greek word for, for defense, apologia, but it, it doesn't quite work in the contemporary context. So he's offering a defiant defense for his crime, and what he has been charged with is essentially philosophy. He's been charged with practicing philosophy. So um, it's a core work of Western political philosophy. It's also very important in relation to how we think about the relationship between um, intellectuals and and the state and why they sometimes come into conflict. In the Crito, um, this is actually, it's kind of the sequel to the defense. Socrates is has been convicted, spoiler alert, um, and he's been convicted of his crime and he's now um, contemplating escape. He's actually being compelled to think about, you know, possibly escaping and, and getting away. And he weighs this possibility against his conception of justice and his reverence for the laws of Athens. And he's thinking about, you know, would it be the just action for me to escape? Um, and kind of grappling with that, that difficult set of questions. Um, so it reveals really kind of two sides of Socrates. Um, Socrates in the defense is quite defined in the Crito. He's less so. And um, it's, it's really interesting to think about, you know, how one interacts with political system and also our responsibilities when we encounter a system of justice, even if it's acted against us in a way that, that has resulted in, 
you know, harm or, or we're suffering in some way. So um, that's what we'll cover in the next lecture. So hop on over to the discussion board and offer your thoughts there. And then you can move on to the next lecture for um, the defense and the credo. All right. Thanks very much.